Nick Ferrari at Breakfast on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Ten minutes before eight, we will come back to our conversation about P&O and those appalling, but I would say sharp, but hopefully maybe even illegal practices of the way staff were dismissed. But let's come back to our conversation in Ukraine and bring in Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, who joins me now. I read, uh, Minister, that we are to deploy Sky Saber missile defence systems, I believe, to Poland and to the so-called theatre. What are they and what do we hope they will achieve? Good morning, Minister. Morning, Nick. Uh, Sky Sabre is a medium range air defence capability uh, that is being deployed to Poland as a reassurance to the uh, Polish people uh, and at the request of the Polish government, because I think they are very, very keen to allow Poland to be used as the uh, as the logistics hub for this huge international effort that is going in to support Ukraine. But very obviously, um, Ukrainian people that are in that corner of, uh, sorry, the Polish people that are in that corner of Poland will probably feel a bit nervous that that might make them a target for Russia. So we've um, we've put those anti-air systems in to give a bit of reassurance. Um, and they're actually, a, they're a good profile of system because they're medium range. They can't threaten Russian aircraft that are legitimately in Russian or Belarusian airspace, um, but they will be absolutely effective at making sure that Polish airspace is defended. An online, I'm told, independent monitor says that the 230 Russian tanks have been confirmed, destroyed, abandoned or captured. That's the greatest loss of tanks by an army since the World War II. It is also reported that Russian generals have been detained by security services for allegations leaking information about the war. Is Putin losing? He's certainly not making the progress that he would have expected to. Uh, and I think that there are plenty of people in the Russian security services, military defence and armed forces that know that this is not going well at all. But Nick, the, the danger is, is that when you look at the map of Ukraine and the territory that Russia has taken thus far, it hasn't changed for a week. Uh, when you look at the intelligence that we had that was really high fidelity uh, of what we knew their plan to be, they are way behind it. There was incredible hubris in the planning. So you would you would start to get really excited that this is nearly over, that the Ukrainians have nearly won, Russia has nearly lost. We mustn't get carried away. What remains of the Russian armed forces is a vast um, uh, army that is ready and able to fight on despite the incredible losses that they are taking. Um, Putin is costing thousands of Russian lives unnecessarily and is taking thousands of, uh, of Ukrainian lives indiscriminately. Um, it needs to stop, but I'm afraid that the... Um, any idea that the military combat will bring itself to a culmination soon is uh, is overly optimistic, I'm afraid. As we hopefully inch towards some kind of deal, Minister, it's reported Britain could act as a guarantor of Ukraine's future security. I'm sure you're aware of that. What would that mean in practical terms and what is the government's response to that? Well, I mean, it's all detailed to be ironed out, but I think the Prime Minister has been very clear that uh, nothing's off the table in terms of uh, how the UK... Uh, would participate in uh, a negotiation process and how we would uh, offer guarantees to the peace process that follows. Um, the one thing that we mustn't do is uh, allow countries in the West to think that it's in their gift to trade away Ukrainian sovereignty over the Donbass or the Crimea as part of negoci negotiations on the Ukrainian government's behalf. The only person who can make decisions like that is President Zelensky and his government. But what the international community must be ready to do is to make sure that if Ukraine and Russia do start to have meaningful conversations and come to terms, that we're willing and able to support them however they ask us to do so. OK. Um, on to other matters. What has your boss, Defence Secretary Ben Wallace, told you about this fake call, this uh, video call with an imposter proposing as a Ukrainian um, MP? Yeah, he was pretty cross. Um, he, uh, I think was embarrassed that it had happened but and he's asked some pretty tough questions of the department about how it happened but nick i know you know ben well um ben well, when you said he was pretty cross i'm glad i wasn't on the receiving end of a pretty cross ben wallace minister yeah yeah uh, you and me that both. would be incoming uh, i think you would call that incoming he, fire he 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 can uh, he can dish out a good bollocking when he needs to uh, <laughs> good on him he um but he but you also know that he's been a security minister for, for years before he's promoted to be secretary for defence. He he just instinctively understands threat and 
is always aware of the means of communication that he's on. He knew he was on Microsoft Teams. He was having a uh, a conversation with someone who he believed to be the Prime Minister of Ukraine. But because it was on Teams, all that Ben was really doing was exchanging platitudes. And Ben's suspicions, because of the way that Ben's mind is so well attuned to security matters, when this guy started asking questions about potential military movements, Ben knew full well that that's not the sort of question that anybody who was really who they say they were would ever ask on Teams. And so he moved pretty quickly to terminate the call thereafter. Is that because the Secretary of State is a military bloke, would you say? Was that why the alarm bells were jangling? Well, maybe, but he's also just really good at his job. The Home Secretary was also in receipt of a call. Was she equally vigilant, to your knowledge? I haven't seen the readout, but I understand that she too had her suspicions that it was a hoax. And, you know, uh, Nick, she also deals day in, day out with matters that are top secret and of grave uh, concern to our national security. She knows full well when she is on a top secret VTC, when she's on a secret VTC, and when she's on Teams. Uh, and I know full well that she will have been equally guarded over what she says on Teams as Ben was. To other matters, it's reported that President Biden will speak today to Chinese leader President Xi for the first time since the invasion. What might this bring about? What would the British government hope could be the involvement of the Chinese president and indeed China itself? Well, I think there's probably two issues, one on the plus side, one on the negative side for um, the president to be discussing with um, President Xi. Uh, firstly, on the negative side, I think there probably is some swift work required to make sure that Russia's requests for more weapons uh, and for China to be the provider of those weapons uh, goes unanswered. Um, Secretary Blinken was pretty robust yesterday, and rightly so, that the US would take a very dim view of China seeking to support Russia. And then on the other side, I think that you know, the two presidents, you know, could, should have a conversation about the role that they could both play in supporting Russia and Ukraine to, to find a peace settlement. And that's that's difficult in Washington because China is very much the, the threat that paces everything uh, with regards to their national security. But the reality is, is that if POTUS is willing to have that conversation with with President Xi, then, then that could be very meaningful. But the first item of business, I suspect, will be to get assurances that Putin isn't going to get um, uh, military support from the Chinese. What do we understand to be the relationship, Minister, between the two men, between President Xi and President Putin? Uh, Nick, I do my best to uh, go way above my pay grade when I can, but right. conversations between the President of the United States and China are all not right. something I'm privy to. Something that we're all privy to is the work the British government did to secure the lease of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, which is a, a great success, and it's and indeed the other British Iranian. We mustn't forget him. He's safely back in South East London with his home. Mike Pompeo, the former US Secretary of State, says the fact that UK paid out nearly £400 million is, and I quote, blood money. What would you say to the former Secretary of State to that? Um, I would say it's not. I would say that there was a legitimate debt that we owed the Iranians. It's been a problem in Anglo-Iranian uh, relations for a long time. Uh, and I think that it's right that uh, in the end we have paid that with um, certain assurances about how the money will be spent. There's a confidentiality agreement between the UK and Iranian governments, which means that I can't really go into the detail of exactly what those conditions are. Um, and you, separately, Nazanin Zahari Radcliffe and other UK nationals detained in Iran have been have been released. That's the that's the situation. Lastly, a little bit out of your brief, but I have to get a word of you on the many people say scandal at PO, 800 yeah. staff dismissed via a Zoom call. Uh, suggestions, of course, that both the trade union and the government are furious about this. Suggestions that the company actually asked for a bailout in the middle of this week and the government was not aware, was not able to do it and did not make the workers aware. A word from you what knowledge you have about this story. Mr Heapy. So I am i wasn't aware of, uh, of the last bit of what you asked. Uh, as far as I knew, government found out about this um, uh, almost as late in the day as as the workers themselves did. But to the uh, broader said, point of how the staff have been handled. Oh, look, shoddy, um, really, really shoddy. And Rob Courts, my my great mate, who's the um, Aviation uh, Transport and Maritime Minister. Minister. Yeah. yeah, you know, in the Commons yesterday, he was clearly seething. Um, you know, and it, it, it's frustrating when you know, in government you like to think that you're kind of all powerful and able to make everything work if only you apply yourself and. Sometimes you can't. Um, I, you know, I, I've been challenged this morning, and rightly, that all I'm doing really is saying it's all shoddy and appalling and shouldn't have happened, um, and, and that will be no consolation to the workers.
That may well be true, but I think it's still important for me as the government minister speaking to you this morning to say that I think it is shoddy and they've been treated appallingly. And now we need to support them as best we can. But P&O have behaved abominably. Grateful for your time. Thank you, Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, appearing here on LBC, where at eight o'clock, the news is next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at eight o'clock, unions are threatened.